Today I have with me my colleagues, the Attorney General and the Minister of Finance, and perhaps we'll start with the Attorney General today. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, just a very uh, important but short um, conf confirmation. Uh, we're pleased at Cabinet level to have passed the approval to move to Parliament for the Cybercrime Bill. Uh, the Cybercrime Bill is something which is intended to replace the Computer Misuse Act. The bill has been through a significant amount of consideration, both under the last government and this government. And in continuing with the importance of the subject matter, I can confirm that we've had some uh, very detailed and involved meetings with the Media Association, with the Publishers Association, and that we have had some sectoral interest um, coverage. The issue of, of course, fake news, the issue of bullying, that is cyberbullying, the issue of harm, as it's described in the draft bill, is something that has been a very um, important factor for our country to consider for some time. The Computer Misuse Act has never quite met the level of protection, given the level of protection that it should have given. And in those circumstances, we've spent quite a bit of time working on this product. The bill involves a three-fifths majority, and therefore will require the consent of more than the government votes. And in those circumstances, we propose to take the bill immediately to a joint select committee of the parliament. It will be introduced tomorrow into the House of Representatives, and we look forward to um, a, a proper consideration of the issues that have been cleaned up um, since the last iterations of the bill um, were seen in the parliament. We think that this is a very important issue to ensure that some of the extreme difficulties that our very uh, young citizens face and our very, um, how should I say, um, underprivileged people face, equally with people who find themselves the victim of attack. Um, we think that this really is an issue for the country to face, and we're very pleased to carry forward this bill to the Parliament. Thank you very much. The Minister of Finance is here. You all would have been following what has been taking place with respect, for example, with the property tax. We had a very informative meeting earlier on this week where both the Minister of Finance as well as the Prime Minister addressed issues. So we've made the Minister of Finance available this afternoon if there continue to be questions with respect to that and any other matter. At this stage, we'll take questions, and I'll tell you all that we are running late for another meeting, but we are here to take as many questions as we can in the limited time that we have. So please, Jules. Minister, uh, what about uh, any concerns of those who are renting, who are tenants, that uh, there may be undue increases in rent uh, due to the implementation of the property tax in the context of uh, you don't have anything called like rent control or so on in Trinidad and Tobago? Well, that was brought up previously, and uh, the government does not have any authority, power, or control over private rental arrangements. Is this something that the government would want to examine at some point in the future in terms of having some rent control? Well, the Rent Restriction Act uh, went out of existence quite some years ago. Would you want to review, or do you think it's something the government should not be involved in? It's not government policy at this point in time. And, or just as a follow-up, uh, the government has been on this uh, campaign delivering its message about the property tax, but yet people still continue to raise the concerns about exorbitant increases in the tax. Do you think that there's some disconnect between the government's message and what people are actually interpreting from it? Well, actually, I do believe that people are coming around to understand, based on the worked examples that we gave, with respect to what the tax on an average home would be, which is in the vicinity of just over $100 a month, $150 a month. People are coming around to understand that, and also coming around to understand that some of the huge figures being bandied about by the other side. You know, for example, I heard a particular example that the tax on an acre of agricultural land would be $50,000, 
and they're coming around to understand now that the tax on a, a parcel of land of that nature might be $200. So, so that the figures being thrown out by people who are opposed are so astronomically wrong. For example, that's a particular example. I heard a, a member of parliament, the member of parliament for St. Augustine, make that statement in the parliament last week, talking about land and saying that the tax on this land would be 50,000. When we did the maths, and in fact I did the maths with some of his colleagues in the parliament while he was speaking, and they worked it out at a at thousand dollars or less. That was a piece of residential land valued at a million dollars, vacant residential land. His own colleagues in front of me did the maths and worked it out at one thousand dollars while he was on his feet saying it's fifty thousand dollars. So the figures being put out by those opposed to the tax are just absolutely ridiculous. And as more and more people understand what we're talking about, as I said, a typical house, I used a diamond veil, three bedroom diamond veil house as an example. We were in Digo Martin, so we used Digo Martin examples. If we were in another part of the country, Tunapuna, we might have used Tunapuna examples. But we were in Digo Martin, and the crowd was primarily a Digo Martin crowd. So we said, all right, we'll talk about a house in Carnage, a house in Goodwood Park, a house in West Morins, a house in River Estate, a house in, in Kokorit, as, as the case may be, in the, in the general environs of the meeting. And, we, and I, use, I use the example, for example, of the River Estate House. River Estate is an old uh, NHA development that was developed maybe 40 years ago, 40, 50 years ago. And I use a typical example of an a average house on an average street in River Estate and put a rental on that house at $3,000 a month and did the worked example to show that the tax on that house would be somewhere in the vicinity of $80 a month or $1,000 per year. I then used the Goodwood Park example where a house in Goodwood Park might rent for $20,000 a month. And I did a worked example to show that the tax on a Goodwood Park house would be $6,000 a year as compared to the house in River Estate, the average working class house, which would be $1,000 a year. Then I did a commercial property example of a shopping mall where the tax on the shopping mall, which might have 100 shops in it, might be $3 million. So a large shopping mall, the tax might be $3 million. Uh, a typical small house in a typical working class neighborhood, the tax might be $1,000. An upper income you know, upper class house in Goodwood Park, the tax would be $6,000. And the reason why I gave these examples was twofold. One, to show that the figures being bandied about by the opposition are ridiculous and wrong, and to show the equity where an upper income person in Goodwood Park would pay $6,000 a year, and a working class man in River Estate would pay $1,000 a year. So it shows the social equity in the property tax. And as more and more people begin to understand what the actual figures are going to be, I think there will be less and less confusion. In addition, what is happening now is that the valuation division is gathering information. So it's an, in an information gathering phase. The notices that have been sent out are not notices of the tax that you have to pay. It is simply a notice to you to send in some brief information details on your property so that the valuation division can gather information. The actual assessment will take place some time down the road and it is when that assessment is completed and the notices are sent to property owners to say this is your tax, this is what you have to pay for the year and they see a thousand dollars, fifteen hundred dollars for the year, then I, a lot of the confusion, most of it will just disappear as far as I am concerned. Clint. Yeah, I just, as we're on the um, topic, um, Minister, and, uh, and it's going to be Attorney General here too, because we still got, got to approach by some squatters who are not, who are still unclear as to whether they do have to pay or not have to pay, even after all that's being set out there. So perhaps um, we could get an interpretation. I'll, 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 I'll hand over to the AG as soon as I'm finished speaking, but I just want to make a point. If you don't own the land, but you have a building on the land that you own, then property tax is due on the building, okay? So if you're on a parcel of land, whether it's rented land 
or lease land or somebody else's land, then you are the owner of a building on the land and you would be required to pay the tax on the building. What, where the confusion is coming up is whether the land that you're on is not yours. Are you required to pay the tax on the land? Well, I want to make it clear, you'll be required to pay tax on the building because you own the building. So I'll now hand it over to the AG. Uh, thank you. This is a very interesting issue. Um, the population is well aware that many persons have applied to the state for what they call certificates of comfort. And certificates of comfort coming out of the land settlement um, entitlements is the situation where the state acknowledges that somebody has a proprietary right as a squatter and they can then move from certificate of comfort eventually into a lease which is granted by the state after the process is carried out. So in that situation, squatters are saying to the country and to the state and to the people, we are the owners of the property. And therefore in those circumstances, the advice rendered so far is that they will be entitled to pay um, taxes because you can't claim that you're the owner, be recognized by the state that you have an entitlement that way and then not um, pay your taxes as a landowner or property owner. The situation with respect to state land in and of itself falls into several subcategories. You can acquire state land by way of adverse possession if you have been over 30 years in occupation and you've been uninterrupted in, in your occupation. For private lands, you can be in a situation where you can claim for adverse possession if you've been in uninterrupted um, adverse possession for 16 years. Persons who wish to have those lands acquired by adverse possession, squatters' rights, take an application to the court and the court considers bringing the lands under the provisions of the real property ordinance. In those circumstances, again, those persons will find themselves on the one hand saying that they are property owners, and here is the evidence of their property ownership in a process to be perfected through the court saying yes, and therefore will find themselves, as the process continues, liable to pay the tax. For persons who are not on property rights, um, in terms of adverse possession, that is you're under 30 years, you're under 16 years, and somebody else is the landowner, you find yourself in the situation and the examples referred to by the Minister of Finance, which is where there can be a disaggregation of the land and the property. But of course that harkens back to a much older um, example of our history and law in a very famous case of um, Cowie and Mitchell where you were talking about chattel homes and the ability to move a home as opposed to not move a home, whether there's a degree of permanence or not, and how you can actually separate out the interest of the house versus the interest of the land. That matter I have asked the Solicitor General's department to consider, and we're certainly um, going to wait just the perfected advice on that. Uh, suffice it to say, the position as advised through the State Departments, that's Chief State Solicitor, and the Solicitor General's Department in conjunction with the Commission of State Lands, that process will be identified. Fortunately, there's room um, for this process to continue, and that's simply because, as the Minister of Finance put out, it's an information gathering exercise at present, and when it is certain, the relevant authorities will then advise by way of notice as to what assessments will be and why it will be so. So in the separate categories, there is there's certainly clarity and there's certainly process. Just let me make a point. If someone is squatting on state lands in a, a dwelling house that they have constructed, certainly they own the dwelling house. The, the issue that needs to get legal clarity is do they own the piece of land that the dwelling house is on? No, it's state land. And if you go into the Property Tax Act, state, property owned by the state is exempt from the tax. So these people are on a piece of land which if they are not the owner of it, it is exempt from tax. The question is, who is the owner of that parcel of land? Because once you have occupied it, you possess it, and you as the Attorney General gave the example, you may have received a certificate of comfort. So you're along the way towards getting ownership 
of that piece of land. And that, in fact, I want to clear this up. That is the point the Prime Minister made. The Prime Minister never said squatters will have to pay property tax. What he said was that it's a very interesting question. Because if, as a squatter, you are claiming that you own the land by virtue of your possession of it, and owners of land have to pay property tax, so that because you want to possess it and occupy it and use it and develop it and so on, you consider yourself to be the owner. But when you come to pay the tax, you say, I'm not the owner. So it's a very interesting question that the Attorney General's office will have to distill, digest, drill down, and see what is the answer to that question. So I just want to clear that up. I heard the Prime Minister myself. He said it's an interesting question. If for one purpose you're the owner, you can't be, you know, as, and this is my words now, as former Prime Minister Pandey used to say, you can't be half pregnant. Is either you're pregnant or you're not. So it's either you are, are the owner of the land or you are not. And that is the question that needs to be resolved. And just to add one last point to that, it's a complicated issue and it has an attachment to various degrees of involvement how long you've been there, what the nature of your claim is, what the nature of your express right is. So in this type of issue, one has to be very careful not to run away with conclusions. In the information gathering stage, a lot will become apparent and then the various categorizations can be sorted out so that you don't unwittingly cause a situation where you've given something away that is state land where you had a right to deal with it otherwise, or you actually acknowledge a right that you should acknowledge. I must add, this is the very reason why we put into the Parliament, and it's on the Parliament agenda right now, four pieces of law to deal with the compulsory registration of all lands in Trinidad and Tobago. That is going to have the method of verifying title for every single square inch of land in Trinidad and Tobago. It's an IDB-funded project which will begin in Tobago and work its way in declared areas inch by inch throughout Trinidad and Tobago so that the entire process of property tax is going to fit in very neatly to the system by which we clean title in Trinidad and Tobago because a lot of people have land that has that is ancestral land, it was in their grandmother's name or grandfather's name, they didn't perfect the title, or they've been living there for very long periods of time. And that's why we took a very purposeful decision to clean up the land registry, clean up title interests, so that you can be closer to what is called an absolute title in Trinidad and Tobago, and we're already in Parliament on that. If I may just add one, one point to that, and it goes, once you've determined the ownership issue that the Minister of Finance an attorney general have dealt with. Remember, you're coming to the value, is the rental value now of that squatters, as we're using the terms, property. All right, so the fear mongering that is taking place and those on the other side who are trying to raise the concerns of persons, after you get through all that has just been discussed, it will then come down to what is the value placed, the rental value placed on it. And you would not expect there to be a very high rental value, if any, placed on it. And then it's a portion of that, right? A 3% of the annual rental value of these homes, all right? So there's no need for the type of fear that's taking place. In fact, I was just going through my mind before Minister Young interjected. I looked at a typical squatter dwelling in my own constituency, and I did a calculation in my head, and I've come up with $20 a month. $20, 20 So why on earth is the opposition going out there and frightening squatters about this tax? You're talking about a tax that if it is ever applied, if, because you have to deal with the ownership first, and if you get over that, you settle the ownership issue, you're talking about $20. If it's, if it's the building alone, is $10. So you're going to tell me you're going to frighten a whole country for $10 a month? And that is what they're doing. And the agricult Dr. Rowley used an agricultural holdings example, a parcel of agricultural land valued at $600,000 with a worked example done by the Institute of Surveyors of Trinidad and Tobago. And when he finished the calculation for the agricultural parcel, 
valued at $600,000, the result of the calculation was a property tax of $10 a month. $10. So which farmer in Trinidad and Tobago can't pay $10 a month in tax for their agricultural plot? So the people who are out there, they're just frightening people for no reason. And all of this is going to come out in the wash, as they say, when the actual notices are delivered to property owners, when they actually see, when a farmer will see that he gets a notice and he has to pay 10 or $20 a month, he will realize that all of this was just scaremongering and fearmongering. On the, on the issue of the retroactivity, um, I think the question can be asked, why, why are people having to pay for government's own tardiness or inefficiency in terms of the implementation of the tax? Because there is the view that the tax would be for 2016 plus and 2017. And a lot of people have a visceral reaction when they hear something is coming, it's being introduced, but it will apply to a past period. Why should we have to, I mean, it's not as though the tax was there and people were negligent or they were delinquent. It is the government that is coming late in the day to say, Ms. State, uh, your question is based on a number of false premises. Let me deal with all of them. The Property Tax Act was subjected to legislative action by the former government, where they waived the implementation of the collection of the tax up to December the 31st, 2015. As it stands, therefore, the Property Tax Act is the law, so that the first year for collection of the tax was 2016. In order to make that not happen, in order for that not to happen, this government will have to go to the Parliament and amend the Property Tax Act in order to allow a waiver for the year 2016. Now, at this time, our focus is on gathering information, producing the valuation rules, which is the list of properties in Trinidad and Tobago, assessing the annual rental value of each property, assessing what the tax will be on each property based on its location, its type, its size, etc. That's our focus right now. And we are doing it right now for the year 2017. The government will have to take a policy decision this government will have to take a policy decision to go to Parliament to amend the Property Tax Act to waive the collection of tax for the year 2016 because that is the existing law. And the law must be implemented unless you amend it. I can tell you this government has not taken any such policy decision one way or the other because what we are doing right now is establishing the valuation rules the assessment notices, the list of properties, identifying owners. We are deeply involved in that very comprehensive body of work. The question as to whether we would go and seek to collect for 2016 is a matter that we will deal with in due course. That too, that proposition that is outside there, that the, there's going to be retroactive application of the tax, is also part of the rumor campaign outside there. It, it, it will be a policy decision of this government, and of course it depends on our economic circumstances, what, sort, what the revenue is looking like. It will be a policy decision of the present PNM government to decide whether we go to Parliament and amend the law to give a waiver for 2016. We are far from that decision. Right now, I want to repeat what the Valuation Division is doing, is focusing on assessment notices for 2017. We will get to 2016 in due course, and the cabinet of Trinidad and Tobago will make an informed decision as to whether we would seek to collect the tax for 2016, or we will go to parliament and waive it. But we are far away from that point. So that the idea that's being floated outside there, that we're going to collect for 20, 2016 and 2017, is just part of the rumor campaign that is part of this process. But that from some of the people in the no, I, I have, that's another false premise, Ms. State. I have to correct you. The, they were asked whether the tax is due and payable 
for the year 2016. And it is due and payable until and unless the law is amended. So as good public servants, they were simply answering a question factually. Is the tax due and payable for 2016? Yes, it is, until the government makes a policy decision to go to the parliament and amend the law. So they were speaking the truth. Okay? Could we have paid the tax in 2016? That is a matter that will form part of the consideration of the discussion at the meeting of the government when it des decides what it will do with respect to that matter. The other Can thing I'd like to ask, um, in the valuation, and this is just an operational matter, um, I mean, we have gone through a period of, well, I want to say a boom, and some of the values that the rental values may have been, come, may have come from a time when, you know, the economy was better. For example, you know, that companies might have been able to can rent. I, can I help you? Yes, hello. I, can, I, can I apologize first for interrupting you and then allow me to assist you? It's the current rental value. It's not the rental value in 2008 when oil money was coming out our ears and the economy was overheating and the country was full of expatriates paying huge prices for rental. It is the current. The, 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 the tax will always be based on the present market rates. Present. So when the valuations are done, it will take into account all of the circumstances. Our difficult financial circumstances, prevailing rates, the, the rentability of a property, the attractiveness of a location, the condition of the property, the age of the property, etc., etc., etc. So it's not going to be a pie-in-the-sky, arbitrary approach. It's going to be an informed and compassionate humanistic approach. Jewel. There are persons who, we talk about the rental uh, value of a property. Uh, persons may rent more often than not a part of their property, maybe a room. They may have some other structure on their property which they don't live in, which they rent. How does that factor into the valuation? I'll, I'll help you on that. The annual rental value is calculated in, diff in different ways. If there's an actual rental taking place, well, it's easy. If there's not, th there's a formula that starts with the capital value, the market price, and a percentage is applied to that to get uh, a notional tax uh, rental value, sorry, a notional rental value, and then the property tax is attached to that. So let's use the example of the piece of vacant residential land, because that's the best one, because it's not being used. Let's say it's worth a million dollars, okay? The calculation, the formula that is used to calculate the annual rental value of a piece of residential land worth a million dollars is you multiply that by 3.5%. So you take the market value, the sales price of this piece of land at a million, you multiply by 3.5%, you get the annual rental value being 35,000. That's not the tax, eh? I wanna make it clear. That annual rental value is not the tax. You then multiply that annual rental value of 35,000, which you've derived from the capital value of a million, by another 3%, and you get $1,050 as being the tax on that vacant piece of land that, that would, per year. So that applies to any property, whether it's a building, whether you use part of it or you don't use part of it. The, the, the evaluators are go going to provide, apply a proportionate approach because you have properties, for example, that are mixed use, residential and commercial. So the part that's commercial will attract the commercial formula the part that's residential that track the residential formula. Then you have vacant land that has a different um, formula. You have machinery out, out of a building that has a formula. You have machinery inside a building that has a formula. So in the Valuation of Land Act, it's all very, very, very clear the way this thing will be done. If there is no rental value that can be determined, you use a formula working it backwards from the capital value to which you apply a percentage, and then another percentage is applied to get the annual um, property tax. 
a mall owner with X amount of shops in a mall and whatnot. Yes. If they are paying that kind of, of, of property tax. Uh, is there the concern about the issue of the downward effect, let's say, increase in prices of goods and services if, in fact, they are paying $3 million in tax as a mall owner and the shops have to then probably pay increased fees? I'm just wondering. Well, let me, let me explain. That's all part of the free market. Let's take a, 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 an example of a mall, a notional example of a mall which, where the owner receives $100 million a year in income. Okay, he, gets his, he gets $8 million a month in income right? Rental income. To work out what he should pay, you apply the commercial rate to that $100 million, which is 5%, and you get $5 million, okay? So that's a big mall where the owner of that mall receives a total of $100 million from all the shops rented for the 12-month period. It is up to the owner of the mall because he has, it's a free market system. If he chooses to pass on that 5%, which by the way is tax deductible, it's tax deductible, so he's not, he's not going to be asked to shoulder the full burden of that um, property tax. If he chooses to pass on the proportion of it that is taxable, it will be up to his tenants to decide whether they would accept that, whether they will remain in the mall, whether they'll go to another mall where maybe a more astute um, mall owner might decide not to pass on the um, property tax to the tenants. It's all part of the free market. It is not something that the government can get into. Yeah, and, and the AG is making a point. When land, the Land and Building Taxes Act was abolished and the property tax was not implemented, it was waived, rents did not go down. But it's all part of the free market. So if you're a tenant in a mall and a landlord wants to pass the full burden of the, the, the property tax onto you. You have a decision to make. Okay, it's, this is not something the government can control. All right. See on the issue of squatting, as in people who are or new squatters, as it were, as you deal with the issue of uh, people who are squatting and may qualify to pay property tax, because we've seen in certain areas where there was state land, it was forested, and then you've just seen whole communities develop, and. While, of course, people understand the need for homes and the demand for housing, there's still the issue of the legality of people occupying state land without authority. Well, the, the, the public servants who have been making the wrongs of the media houses made it clear there's no nexus, there's no link whatsoever between property tax and any claim for ownership. Claim for ownership is a completely separate issue and as a matter will be dealt with by the state's lawyers. Last question about how the property tax will be spent, um, especially for persons who will be paying the tax. They want to know, will it be spent in, on regional <coughs> uh, um, corporations, on roads, on drains? Where, where exactly is the tax that, And uh, I don't think the persons who are making that point have looked at the estimates of revenue and expenditure. We had estimated that when we get the property tax system into full operation, which means residential, commercial, industrial, agricultural, everything, that we would generate $500 million per year. The, the, the Ministry of Local Government alone consumes over $2 billion a year. So the property tax is just a fraction of what is already spent on local government services. The other point is that when we collect value-added tax and we collect income tax and we collect petroleum profits tax and we collect customs duty, all of these taxes go into the consolidated fund to be distributed to the areas that require funding. If, for example, we were to say that municipal corporations should rely on property taxation for their funding, there will be a shortfall in funding of almost $2 billion. So the, the people who are saying that, they, they're not appreciating that firstly, property taxes cannot possibly pay for the services provided by the local government system nor could it possibly pay for all the other services that are associated with the community, such as the police service, the fire service, the, the, the health department. These are all community services. Property tax couldn't possibly pay for that. It would be a, it's a drop in the bucket, in the $50 billion bucket. Even though it's $500 million, think, think about it. $500 million is only 1% of the annual budget of Trinidad and Tobago. Let me do those maths for you again. Our expenditure is 50 billion. Property tax is 500 million. Okay? 1%.
in local government reform is an issue that came up, and that's where that conversation starts. We are in the process of drafting the legislation for local government reform, and it is something that we're actively looking at. But exactly as the Minister of Finance has said, is a drop in the bucket, and that's what we were seeing at local government reform. Last, last question, Ms. Tate. Um, I'm just curious, do churches and like private schools um, pay property tax? There's a list of exemptions in the act. It's very, it's very um, straightforward. But I know that churches, places of worship are in there. I believe educational establishments are in there, but don't hold me to it. I know that churches are inside of there, but it's all in a list in the act. But my assembly, there's an argument that these religious and educational organizations are becoming more and more profitable. So why are they being exempted? That is the law as it, as it stands. You see, a lot of questions are being asked that are not in context. There is a property tax act that has been on our books since 2009. And in that law, there are exemptions. If we were to change that, the government would have to go to parliament with an amendment act to change the list of exemptions. Right now, we just want to implement the law. We don't want to go and tinker with it and say, all right, uh, if, if, if you look at a church and you find it looking wealthy, we will not exempt them. But a, a poor church, we will, you see that kind of tinkering? This government has no intention of doing that at this point in time. We don't see that as productive and useful. We have an act, we just want to go on and implement the act. I bring in a dictionary next week for the definition of last. Huh? Jewel. Yesterday on a public accounts of the crisis committee, uh, the chairman of TSTT um, had said that he did not need uh, to inform the cabinet of TSTT's decision to acquire Massey Communications. It was an operational decision, even though the government appoints the board. Uh, is this something that is of concern to the cabinet, or you support the chairman's position? This is actually something that is currently being looked at by the cabinet. All right, there's something that's happened, and we're informed of it, and it's something that we're currently looking at. The chairman have informed the cabinet prior to the acquisition. It depends on the decision, the nature of the decision. We are going to ask TSCT to explain to us exactly what are the implications of that decision so one can determine whether it is a governance matter, an operational matter, how a policy matter, how does it affect the government's policy for the continuation of TSTT in terms of an acquisition of a company, including all of the personnel that come with the company and so on. We are going to request um, details of the acquisition so we can understand what it is, and then we will address the matter.